Okay, so today we are going to be reviewing the third book in the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. So if you have not been following my reviews, basically here is how they work. I have a spoiler free and then a spoiler segment in the one review. I start off spoiler free telling you three, pro there, three cons and three pros of a book. Then we go into the spoiler version and I discuss all the things I want to talk to you guys about when it comes to the book that I'm reviewing. If you have not seen my earlier reviews Harry Pot on, in the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, you can check them out by going to my playlist to my Harry Potter section. Hey, it's my first section that is given the name of a series, so I'm really excited about that. So feel free to check those ones out over there. Now, in my first review, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, first review of this series anyway, because I've done many prior to that one, but my first review in this series, I did a, I spoke about the book and then I did a comparison between the books and the book and the film adaptation. In the second review that I did, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, I said I wasn't going to compare the book to the film and then I ended up comparing the book to the film. So what I'm going to do with this one is I'm just going to say I'm going to review the book and I might make comparisons between the book and the film. We'll see how we go. But that's enough for this intro. Let's move directly on to the review by talking in the non-spoiler section about what I thought of this book. Three cons and three pros. Let's get to it. Okay, so it's time for my non-spoiler section of this book, starting off with three cons. That's right, three things I did not like about this book in a spoiler-free way. So my first con about this book is continuity. So I love all of, well, almost all the books in this series. We'll talk when we get to the last one, but... Otherwise, I love all the books in this series, so I have to think really hard and nitpick all the cons. So please don't think that I don't love these books. I gave the first two books five stars. I've given this book five stars. I do love it, but there are still some cons. Continuity. So in book one and in book two, our protagonists learn some spells that really would have come in handy in this book. And for some reason... They either just don't think to use them, which if anyone's going to come back to me and say they just didn't think to use them, they have someone within the trio of protagonists who has been quoted as many, many, many occasions as being the brightest witch of her age. So <laughs> that just wouldn't work for me. But they're either forgetting that they know these spells, forgetting to use them, or for whatever reason, these spells are taught and then they're just never meant to be used again. It just doesn't make sense to me. So I will go into more detail in the spoiler section. I'm just going to say Harry and his broom. So something happens with Harry's broom. I won't go into it. And in book one, one of the characters does a spell that would have assisted so greatly with the broom and it didn't happen in this book and I don't know it just really confused me so continuity as far as spells that have been learned that weren't used when they really would have made things so much easier had they been used in this book is my first con about this book. My second con about this book is the way that it wraps up. This is not a long book at all. In fact, it is, it's, yeah, 317 pages long for this particular version. So it's not a long book. After the big climax occurs, we then have the end of the book where things are, you know, wrapping up. In the first two books, there was more time taken for the wrap-up at the end of the book, and I really appreciated that because there were some pivotal moments that occurred at the end of, well, not necessarily pivotal, but really big moments that happened towards the end of the book after the massive climax has occurred, and yet in this one, 
it's like massive climax occurred. Okay, now we've got to quickly hurry up because we've gone over 300 pages and we need to quickly wrap this up in a nice little bow and, and move on to the next thing. And I, I just didn't appreciate that. I'll get into more on that in the spoiler section. But I just felt that there was more needed in this book to wrap it up in a much more well-rounded way. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> My third con for this book, again, I'm going to say some words here, but not spoil it, and then go into it in the spoiler section, is Wormtail's story not reaching a conclusion. So if you have not read this, you have no idea this book, or seen the films, then you have no idea who Wormtail is, and that's wonderful. <coughs> Excuse me. Suffice it to say, there is a character in this book whose name is Wormtail, or his nickname is Wormtail, and his story doesn't reach a conclusion, and that annoyed me emotionally. Logically, I understand why what occurred did, but emotionally, it left me unsatisfied. But now that I've told you three cons about this book, let's discuss three pros woo, about this book. Spoiler free, let's go to it. Okay, so my three pros for this book. My first pro for this book, spoiler free, is Hermione's character growth. Again, I'm not going to go into spoilers. All I'm going to say is there is a main character whose name is Hermione. She uh, goes through so much growth in this book that I had forgotten about, and I'm so excited to discuss that with you guys when we get to the spoiler section, but yeah, she goes through a lot of growth, and it was is I very much appreciate that this happened. The second pro that I have for this book is the Time Turner device. Again, leaving it spoiler free, you guys know that that's in the book, but if you haven't read the book or seen the films, you don't know what it is or what it does, so, and how it's used, so I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to say that I really appreciated having that in this book because I feel like it made this book so much fun, and I will discuss that more when we get into the spoiler section. My third and final spoiler-free pro for this book is Quidditch. So, Without, again, spoiling too much, Quidditch is the sport that is played in Harry Potter's world, in the magical world that Harry Potter is a part of. And in the movies, so here comes my compa first comparison, in the movies, the sport of Quidditch, I don't enjoy watching it. I just, I don't, for many reasons that we'll discuss at some other stage, but I love reading when the sport is going on because the the way that it's written about is so much fun. <laughs> so that is my third pro for this book. Trust me, I have many more pros that I could say about this book, but we're leaving it to three pros and three cons. So I am going to leave the spoiler free section here because there's so much I want to discuss in the spoiler section and I don't want to run out of time. So if you have not read this book and you do not want to see the spoiler version, then I completely understand and I'll see you again very, very soon. For those of you sticking with me, we're going over to the spoiler section right now. Here we go. Okay, it's spoiler time. You've been warned. I'm not going to say it again because I'm going to take up too much time. So spoiler time, here we go. First spoiler I'm going to give you is that I gave this book five stars, in case I haven't said that before. I Not only do I love this book so much, but arguably this is my favourite book in the entire series for so many reasons. But the way I'm going to tailor this uh, spoiler section of my review is I'm going to go back through those pros and cons and discuss them in more detail, and then if I have more time, we can talk bonus stuff at the end. So, starting off with the first con that I had for this book, I referred to the spells, and the spells that the characters had learned in book one and in book two. So let's talk about Harry's broom, right? So, as we know, Harry's broom is smashed into a million pieces, and there's, according to Harry, Nothing that can be done about the fact that it's been broken into a million pieces. Excuse me, just a moment. So, let's go back, all the way back to Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, book one, where Harry is on the train with Ron, Hermione comes in, and after having a bit of a discussion, Hermione obviously notices that, notices that Harry has glasses that aren't exactly perfect, there are issues with the glasses, like they're not broken, but they're kind of broken, and she sits opposite him in the film, and she also st 
stands next to him uh, in the book, and she says the spell Oculus Repairo. In other words, repair these glasses, and the glasses get repaired. Repairo, the spell on its own, literally exists to repair things that have been broken. So can someone explain to me why Harry couldn't have tapped one of the pieces of his broom and said Repairo and had the Nimbus, whatever it was, 2000, 2001, whatever it was, repair and, oh sorry, I think it's Nimbus 2000. Why couldn't he have tapped any of those pieces of the wood, tapped on it and said Repairo and had the Nimbus 2000 be repaired and there would have been no issues. Now, logically, I get why a lot of things happen. This is more coming from an emotional standpoint, but also from an it doesn't make sense standpoint because they've learned these spells, why aren't they using them? So Harry does end up getting the Firebolt and that's an amazing thing and it helps him obviously to win Quidditch uh, by the end of the book for his, his house and that's wonderful, don't get me wrong, but the fact that he is so upset to see it smashed into bits, I understand, but when Lupin asks him, is there nothing you can do for it? And he says, no, there's nothing I can do for it. I don't understand. I wish that JK Rowling had at least added a sentence of Harry saying to Lupin, no, there's nothing I can do for it. And insert my little sentence here. I tried to use the Repero spell, but I guess it wouldn't work because it was cut into too many pieces. That I would have accepted, but it was just Harry giving up. Now, hello, you're a wizard and you have arguably the brightest witch of her age in your constant company. How is it that you guys couldn't work? You can do like Polyjuice potions and things that are really crazy advanced. Uh, the um, Patronus and all these sorts of things, but you can't fix your broom when there is a perfectly acceptable Repero spell. It doesn't make sense. Also, uh, back in the div first divination class that they've ever taken for their year level, Professor Trelawney makes a prediction that Neville is going to break the first cup that he has, and so she says, can you please take one of the blue ones when you break the first one? So when he breaks the first one, again, why doesn't the teacher, why doesn't Professor Trelawney or someone else say repairo and repair the cup? It doesn't make sense. They know this spell. I just... It, it just doesn't make sense to me. And there are many other things as well that don't make sense to me. For example, in the second book, Hermione obviously knows the spell. I believe in the film she um, enunciates the term immobilis uh, with the Cornish pixies. In the book, it doesn't really say the spell, it just says Hermione immobilized the pixies, but doesn't say the spell that she uses. But let's go with movie lore and call this spell immobilis. The amount of times the Immobilis spell could have been used to assist them, and it was only ever used with the Pixies, it just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Is there limitations of the amount of... Again, it's a soft magic system, so we don't know the limitations of spells. It's not spelled out to us, but being as into fantasy as I am these days, especially hard core, hardcore magic systems rather than soft magic systems, it just upsets me that it's either not being used or it's not being explained. So, you know, when they're trying to rescue Buckbeak, why couldn't they just use Immobilis on Dumbledore and Hagrid and Fudge and McNair, and that would have given them an hour or whatever it is. I mean, I guess Immobilis doesn't stop someone from seeing you, but at least it would freeze them momentarily. You know what I mean? So the lack of continuity when it comes to spells that are learned really does get to me in little moments of this book and others as well, where I'm thinking, why aren't you using these spells? It just doesn't work for me. So I quickly, with on that, I want to go back to book one. Now, I understand that Hermione used the Immobilis spell in the second book. However, in the first book, as we know, one of the traps, I guess, that Harry has to move past to get to the Philosopher's Stone is the Flying Keys. Every time... I see this film, or every time I read Philosopher's Stone, and certainly it happened last time when I was reading it, I just kept thinking, why didn't Hermione just use Immobilis on the keys? <laughs> and then Harry could have caught the key. Now, you can, of course, come back to me and say, well, Hermione only used Immobilis from the second book onwards, and therefore maybe she didn't know Immobilis in the first book, and I would understand that, and I'll, I'll forgive 
her for not using it then, but it doesn't excuse all the other times post the first time she used that spell that she never uses it again when it would have come in so much handy. But anyway, rant over onto the next con. Okay, so the next thing that I want to talk about is not taking enough time at the end of the book. So in the first two books, what I'm referring to is the year end feast. And I'm quickly going to jump in here and make a comparison with the films that really gets to me. So if you've only seen the film, you would know that at the end of the third year, Harry's third year at Hogwarts, Professor Lupin packs up his stuff and leaves the school because he is afraid that parents are going to send in owls saying that they don't want their, their child being taught by a werewolf. And that's sad, but it is what it is. I didn't want him to go either, guys. I wanted him to stay as well. But logically, I guess it makes sense that he's thinking this, so he has to go. In the film, he leaves, and that's it, and then we go to the feast. In the book, Professor Dumbledore comes in to the classroom moments before Lupin leaves. Then Lupin leaves, and Harry has a discussion with Dumbledore, just like he did at the end of Philosopher's Stone in the hospital wing, and then uh, in the Chamber of Secrets in his office, Harry and Dumbledore have conversations pretty much at the end of every book. And I love these wrap-up conversations that they have. It is in this book. They have a great conversation about how much Harry has done for Sirius and for Buckbeak, saving both of them. But it didn't make it into the film, which really annoyed me. Yes, Lupin says the line, you know, you saved a convicted man. But I just feel like it would have meant, as much as I love Lupin, it would have meant so much more hearing it from Dumbledore. Now, obviously, things changed with Dumbledore because the original Dumbledore died at the end of the second film, and there was a replacement Dumbledore in the third film onwards, which I have so many issues with that replacement, but I'm trying to let that go. But these important conversations still need to be there. And then what about the end of, t- end of year feast? where the houses are awarded the House Cup, which I think Gryffindor won, but it was to set in one line. For the third year running, Gryffindors won the House Cup, so the hall was decorated in scarlet and orange or yellow or whatever colour it is for Gryffindor. Really, I'm a Ravenclaw, so, you know, (laughs) I'm just going to let Gryffindor colours go. But it was like one or two lines. It was so much more fun in the first book how Gryffindor won the House Cup. Now, maybe it wasn't as dramatic this time with the House Points, but at the very least, maybe Dumbledore would have had a nice year-ending speech or something that just didn't appear in this book, and it just left me... It left me hanging, and I didn't like that. So that's the reason why I had that as my second con. So my third con, as I did say in the spoiler-free section, is much more an emotional con than a logical one. I understand why this had to happen, but that doesn't mean that emotionally I'm satisfied with the fact that it happened, and it annoys me every single time I read it. I am, of course, talking about Wormtail turning back into a rat and running away and escaping from the doom that he was meant to be going through. So Harry goes through an amazing character arc, which I did not discuss uh, uh, in my spoiler-free first pro, but I will be talking about that when I get to the pro section. Harry goes through something in this book that is really subtle if you're not looking for it, but oh my gosh, it, it paves the way for the next for the final four books. It really does. And I'll get to that in a moment. But let's talk about the fact that Harry says to Sirius and to Lupin in the Shrieking Shack, no, you're not going to kill him, Peter Pettigrew, because I don't think my brother would want his best friends to be killers. So we're going to take him to the castles and the Dementors will have him. On the way back, obviously, Harry talks to Sirius and Sirius says, do you want to come and live with me? Because I don't know if you know this, but technically I'm your guardian. And we have this wonderful moment where my heart leaps every time I read this, because I keep forgetting about that moment till it happens. How Harry goes, oh my God, I get, to, I get to leave the Dursleys and not be with them anymore and be with someone who loves me and live in the magical world. And oh my God, it's so good. The only thing that's ever going to stop them, or sorry, the only thing standing between Harry and Sirius being able to live together and have a happy life is getting Peter Pettigrew, who has been pretty much handcuffed to Ron and to Lupin, is getting him into the castle and telling everyone 
he is the one that betrayed the, betrayed the Potters, not Sirius, and then all would have been fine. And then, because of the full moon and Lupin turning into a werewolf, Pettigrew has enough time to turn back into a rat and he escapes, and that just annoys me so much. I fully understand when Harry goes back in time how he says, Hermione, I can grab him right now. He's right there. And Hermione's like, you can't be seen. I get that you can't be seen, but I'm so on Harry's side. Just grab him. <laughs> Just grab him and lock him up somewhere until we can sort the rest of this out. But anyway, it annoys me. Logically, again, I do get it because of what happens in the books to come, which I won't spoil because I'm not up to those ones. But, Lu um, sorry, not Lupin. Pettigrew had to escape for other things to happen. So I do get it. It's just emotionally, I really wanted Harry to live with Sirius. And it just annoyed me that because of these little, well, kind of plot convenience, not really because Harry didn't want this to happen, but it seems like a plot convenience because it was just too convenient. <laughs> suddenly it's a full moon night. Suddenly Lupin is forced to change into a werewolf and suddenly Pettigrew is able to grab a wand and turn back into a rat and run away. And that just always annoyed me and never s sat right with me. Still, this is one of my favourite books, but that just never sat right with me. All right, let's gush now about this book and talk about those three pros I was telling you about a little earlier. So, my three pros. Spoiler style. Hermione and Harry's character growth. Let's get into this. So, First of all, let's talk about Hermione. Hermione Granger is one of my all-time favourite characters, male or female, and is arguably my favourite female character ever. I loved her from day one, I lo and I said this in my first two reviews, especially when Hermione's teaching Ron Wingardium Leviosa how Ron's just misunderstanding her. She's trying to help him. I love this girl, so... <laughs> and hey, is it surprising that the haunting... The sorting, the haunting hat, really. Hmm, haunting his who? The sorting hat nearly puts her in Ravenclaw. Not really, she should have been in my house, but that's okay, I'll let that go. I have loved Hermione from day one. She is a book lover and a rule enforcer who has a very famous line, now I'm going off to bed until either of you do think of something else that's going to get us killed, or worse, expelled. I just love her. <laughs> anyway, but in this book she goes from book lover slash rule enforcer to fearless warrior, and it is just amazing. The fact that she kind of puts her schooling aside to ensure that she can help Hagrid as much as she can with Buckbeak, the fact that she punched Malfoy, something she would never do normally, but she was just so angry that she didn't care about what the consequences were, and other things that she does along the way as well. It's just amazing to see her growth in this book, and we can now see, while we may not have necessarily been able to see in book one and two, except for tiny glimpses here and there, we can now definitely see why Hermione was placed into Gryffindor and not Ravenclaw because of her bravery. She's just going to go and ahead and do these things despite the risk, although it's different to Slytherin. She's doing it for I'm just going to say the right reason, <laughs> but anyway, I don't hold any grudges against Slytherin, but I'm just saying, you know what I mean. There's a difference between bravery and cunningness. All right, now let's talk about Harry. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is a massive moment with Harry's character development in this book that if you blink, you would have missed it. So it takes place in the Shrieking Shack. Harry is talking uh, to Sirius, or Sirius rather is talking to Harry, and the next thing you know, Harry's, I, well, I kind of pictured that Harry was on top of Sirius with his wand pointed to Sirius, but I think maybe he was just standing up and pointing his wand, I don't know. Either way, Harry is in a situation where he is, has his wand pointed at Sirius, and Sirius is unarmed, and his thoughts, which is one of the things I love about these books compared to the film as well, is that in the books you get to actually know what he's thinking, where the films don't really portray that that well at all. But let's just let that go. In his head, he's thinking, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to murder you, everything you've done to my parents, that's it, you're going to die, I'm going to kill you now. This is a very important moment. Now, I'm not quoting it word for word, but if you've read the book enough times, you know what I'm referring to. And if you don't remember that, 
pick up this book again, go back to the Shrieking Shack, and read just the moments where Harry has his wand pointed at Sirius before Lupin comes into the Shrieking Shack. These thoughts of Harry thinking he's going to kill Sirius, despite the fact that he doesn't do it, he is dead certain he's going to do this, yes, pun intended, he's dead serious, uh, that he, dead serious, oh my gosh, many puns, that he is going to kill him, really does pave the way, because ultimately, Harry needs to kill, quote unquote, all of the Horcruxes, which I'm not going to spoil, but they're a big part of the book, a series, <laughs> uh, along the way. This is his first murderous thought. In the other books, Harry doesn't kill for the sake of wanting to kill someone. He ends up killing Professor Quirrell, well, kind of, that's debated, because the film is very different to the book, how Quirrell dies, but he defends himself and then Quirrell is dead. In The Chamber of Secrets, it's the same thing with the Basilisk. Harry defends himself and the basilisk dies. So Harry doesn't set out with malicious intent to kill anyone until book three, when he does set out with malicious intent to kill Sirius, despite the fact that he doesn't go through with it. And this paves the way, as I've said, for him to be able to deal with the Horcruxes moving forward. So very big moment for Harry that I must have skimmed over so many times when I read this book in the past, but picked it up this time and needed to mention it here. Pro number two, the time-turning device. Oh my gosh. One of the biggest reasons I love this book is because of the time-turner. While there may be little things that I forget, like the, uh, what's it called? Professor Trelawney's class, divination. While I forget about the divination exam, which I totally forgot about that exam, and they should have had that in the film, but anyway, because they stuffed up with the film so much, but anyway. It gets worse and worse as we go along with them adding things in that don't need to be added in, dragging things out that don't need to be dragged out, and then completely leaving things out that could have gone into those sex spots instead. But anyway, letting that go. Um, the Time Turner is one of the biggest reasons why I love this book, and it's something that I'll never forget about this book. The fact that we go back in time and we get a second chance to do it all over again. I loved that idea so much. It was just really, really good. And, and speaking of the time turner, rereading this book now, having read it that many times, it was great rereading it and having all those moments with Hermione and how Harry and Hermione don't know how she's getting to those classes um, that are at the same time and all this stuff. And uh, it's just like, I know what's happening now. Hermione goes to see Professor McGonagall at the start of the year. Oh, because that's when she's getting the time turner. And uh, it's so good. <laughs> But anyway, so I love the time turner. I love that they went back in time. I wish they'd gone back in time more than once. And with the same thing, I would have been fine with that. So let's say that the second time they're able to rescue Buckbeak, but they're not able to save Sirius. So let's just do it one more time and save Buckbeak once more. And now make sure we're saving Sirius. And God, I just could have, we could have spent the whole time using the time turner. Yes, pun intended with the word time. But we could have spent the whole time using the time turner and I would have been just really happy. I love that that element was added to this book. And now let's talk about Quidditch. Oh my gosh. So I have the feeling that whoever is directing whichever of the Harry Potter films, because the directors change all the time, they all have their own individual goals of what they want to portray in the films. Now, while the first two films probably portray the books the closest out of all of them, the first one probably does the best out of all of them, still misses things, there's always something that seems to be prioritised with, and it's either more drama or more humour, certainly more drama in Philosopher's Stone. Neville does not fly around on his broomstick for five minutes bumping into walls and flying off and flying back and no, none of that happens. And in the second one, uh, more humour, Ron making all those faces while Harry's talking to Aragog, no. <laughs> like, yes, Ron is scared, but it's not the point. But the film makes it look like it's meant to be a funny scene when it's not. And in this book, there are many things that go on that it's, it's not that they are keeping things out of the movie, but they're kind of make, changing the whole 
feel of the movie from the book, which really gets to me. And I've talked about Dumbledore being in Lupin's office and that not being included and how that annoyed me. And Dumbledore is very different, but we'll get to that another day. With Quidditch, one of the best things about Quidditch is that Lee Jordan commentates. We do hear this in film one. Lee Jordan saying, there's another goal for Gryffindor and, and it makes Quidditch more fun. He is not in any of the other films, but the Quidditch matches themselves are so interesting and intriguing in the book that in the film, they're not. The Quidditch matches are more set out to be an action-packed moment where Harry and Malfoy are flying through the barriers around the side of the Quidditch pitch for no reason other than to make it look more action-packed than it is, and that really annoys me. But to keep with the positive, the way the Quidditch matches are portrayed in these books are so much more fun than they are in the film. I don't enjoy Quidditch in the films. Quite frankly, I can skip those scenes easily, but in the books, oh my god, I love them. So when Harry wins the house, the Quidditch, sorry, Quidditch Cup for Gryffindor in this book, it is such an amazing moment given how much work they do, how much wood puts them through in this book. Such a great moment that just cannot be appreciated by anyone who's just watched the films because it's not yeah, it's just not portrayed the way that it should be, in my opinion. But all in all, this book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher... Uh, no, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, is arguably my favourite book in the entire series. I will re I'll rank the books in order when I'm done with them, but for now, it is my favourite book in this series because of the time turner. I love it so much and because of the things that they miss in the films that I think would have made the film so much more, of, gave given it so much more of a homely feel than it does. It comes across as being way too dark, much darker than it should be. But anyway, you sound off with your thoughts below. What do you think about the book compared to the film? What do you think about this book in general? Do you agree with what I said? Do you disagree with what I said? What are your pros and your cons? Let me know in the space below. But this has been my review of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban by J.K. Rowling. It is a middle grade fantasy and I've given this book five stars. So I'm going to leave that there and let you guys go. Peace, blessings, and so, so, so much love. I post videos every Monday, Thursday, and Sunday with reviews on Monday, midweek vlogs on Thursday, and end of of week vlogs on Sundays. Until then, happy reading to all of you, and I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching. Bye guys. Bye.